Okay, our next Ageless Educator, Dr. Sandra Kaufman. <laughs> Very excited to have her back with us. Dr. Sandra Kaufman received her medical degree at the University of Maryland and completed, shh, please sit down quickly, quietly. Thank you guys. She received her medical degree at the University of Maryland and completed a residency and fellowship at John's, John Hawkins in the field of pediatric anesthesiology. For the last five years, she has been the chief of pediatric anesthesia at the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, a nationally recognized center of excellence. Her avid, her avid interest in the science of anti-aging began many years many years ago as an interest hobby, intense hobby. Utilizing her knowledge in cell biology, human pharmacology, and physiology, this hobby has now become a main focus. Dr. Kaufman will be talking today on the Kaufman Protocol for Unlimited Wellness. Please welcome Dr. Sandra Kaufman. <laughs> Hello? So first of all, thank you for inviting me back. This is my second time I've been here. I'm ex so excited to be here. Um, I recognize some faces, but not all faces. I'm going to try to uh, entertain you, educate you. Clearly, I will not bore you. Um, I am obnoxious. I am sarcastic. Um, and I love audience participation. So if I say things you don't understand, tell me. If I say things that you've already heard before, tell me, and I will fast forward through those things. With any luck, I'll get the thing that makes this work in a second. Yes. Aha, good. OK, so I am Dr. Kaufman of the Kaufman Protocol. And there is a book floating around, Why We Age and How to Stop It. The last time I was here, I spent most of my time talking about the first half, Why We Age. Uh, I'm going to breeze through that quickly this time and get to the uh, how we can stop it part to give you guys some more practical advice. Uh, I understand throughout the week you've been given very expensive things to do. Um, my goal is to make anti-aging more accessible to everyone. I want people to understand it and I want you to be able to afford it. Okay? <laughs> Uh, I was going to tell you who I am, but uh, they did a great job introducing me. So I am a working physician. Everyone wants to know what being a pediatric anesthesiologist has to do with aging, and the answer is absolutely nothing. Um, it just allowed me the ability to take my medical knowledge and apply it to us and uh, hopefully uh, advance the uh, science of anti-aging. All right. So you guys probably know all of this, but I'm going to assume you don't, but I will breeze through it rather quickly. When I built my model of anti-aging, I tried to build this so that people that did not understand a whole lot of science could understand what went on in the human body. So I created what I call the factory model. Um, so if you can understand how a factory works, you can understand how uh, not aging works. So first off, if you were to build yourself a factory, what do you need? There are seven components. You need the operating manual, everything written for a company, right? What, is it, what are you going to make? How is it going to run, et cetera, et cetera. Everything has to be written down. You need an energy source, very apparent. Uh, every factory has pathways, assembly lines, feedback loops, uh, all that sort of thing. Quality control, you have to check your widgets, make sure they're functioning, right? You need a security system, that's your immune system, and we're going to breeze through that very quickly since you just got a whole earful of it. Uh, and then your workforce, these are your individual employees of your factory or your individual cells in your body. They have different requirements. And lastly, if you don't take out the garbage, you're sort of screwed, right? So the last category is waste management. How does this apply to your cells? Uh, every time I send you guys slides, they get a little bit screwed up, so I apologize. Uh, the company operating manual, that's your DNA. All right? Everything written about your body that your body needs is in your DNA. Uh, your energy source, clearly your mitochondria. Right? Do you guys need to stretch more? We can do that. That was kind of fun, right? <laughs> All right, everybody. All right. 
there are innumerable medical pathways in your body. Every system is based on pathways. The ones that are important to us, the sirtuins, the AMP kinase, and of course the mTOR pathway. Quality control. We have to check our cells just like we check our widgets. There are four protein uh, repair mechanisms. There are four DNA repair mechanisms. In the security system, again, that's your immune system, individual uh, workforce, there's your cells and waste management. I put AGEs in there and lipofusion. Okay? You guys probably know this. We're going to do it quickly. Well, always good for a review, right? What can happen to your DNA over time? We all know about epigenetic modification, right, everyone? Yes, no? Yes, no, yeah, good. And I know you guys love and adore Bill Andrews, and he is the king yeah. of telomeres and telomerase, so we're just going to breeze through that. Uh, mitochondria, we all know about mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. Regard, or re depending on what type of cell you're talking about will determine how many you need. A liver cell has between one to 2,000 mitochondria per cell. Uh, an oocyte has about 10,000. If a cell is about to become an egg, it revs up to about uh, 500,000. It's incredibly important. Uh, there is a theory that says menopause is secondary to mitochondrial failure. So if you can keep your mitochondria healthy, you may be able to, to uh, avoid menopause, which is kind of nice. So what goes wrong in mitochondria? Two essential things. Number one, you become NAD deficient. That is a necessary uh, element of the electron transport chain. So you don't make any energy if you lose your NAD. And secondly, Every time you use oxygen, between 1 to 10 percent of those molecules become toxic, they become radicalized, they become little toxic bombs, and they destroy you from the inside out. Uh, everyone knows that you do need some radicals for communication within the cell, but too many is a bad thing. You have endogenous antioxidants, but of course, over the course of time, you lose these, so we can always use more. Pathways, as I said, sirtuins, AMP kinase pathway, mTOR pathway, these were all discovered secondary to the idea that caloric restriction elongated life. Uh, everyone good with this? I'm speeding along these so we can get to the, the fun stuff at the end. Uh, quickly, okay, nope. Uh, just because I don't think you guys have heard about sirtuins too much this week, it's the silent information regulator gene. Discovered in the year 2000, they discovered that if yeast had an extra copy, they lived 30% longer. If they had uh, one less, conversely, they lived 30% less. They are NAD deficient. It, NAD is a coenzyme for this. So if you are NAD deficient, much like the mitochondria not working, your sirtuins don't work. So NAD is quite important. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. They sense the environment and they serve to promote survival. So they get turned on and off depending on what the environment allows you to do. There are seven of a million sirtuins. One, of course, we all know the most about. That's why it's named number one. It does innumerable things. The two things that I like about it, number one is it controls your circadian rhythms. As you have probably noticed, as people get older, they don't sleep as well. And one of the prime reasons for this is that your circadian, ryth or your circadian rhythms are controlled by sir your sirtuins. So if you are sirtuin deficient and you are NAD deficient, you are not going to sleep. The problem with not sleeping is that 10 to 15 percent of your proteins are made at night, so therefore you become protein deficient. Therefore, it is a circling, circulating domino effect problem that we can solve quite easily. The other kind of fun thing about SIR2 and 1 is if you can fix it, some of the inflammatory issues that uh, the previous guy spoke about don't happen. Uh, 2 is less exciting, we're going to skip through that. Uh, it is an epigenetic modifier, however, and controls mitosis. So two and three is one of my favorites. It affects brown fat. As you guys may or may not remember, I am a junk food junkie. You guys are probably health fanatics. You probably watch what you eat. You all go on caloric restriction diets. I eat donuts every day. Oh, shoot. Help. Apparently that's a bad word in this room, yeah. <laughs> I eat high caloric carbohydrate substances. <laughs> that worked, that was good, right? All right, so everyone knows there's white fat and there's brown fat. White fat is normal caloric storage. Brown fat uh, is basically for warmth. If you live in cold climates, you have a lot of it, you burn it off um, just making uh, warmth. So basically, the more brown fat you have, the more calories you burn doing absolutely nothing, and the more calorically loaded carbohydrates you get to consume on a regular basis. 
Uh, four, five, and six are not too exciting. Six is nice because you do, um, helps your telomeres. Again, it prevents uh, dye-induced obesity. Helps with DNA repair, which is kind of fun. Seven doesn't really do too much, but you have to include it. Otherwise, people say, what does seven do? <laughs> so of course, they're twins. They go down with age. NAD goes down with age. So we need to work on activating that. AMP kinase, I'm sure you guys know about that as well. It is the metabolic master switch. It acts like the sirtuins in that it senses the environment and it turns on and off to promote survival. So if you have less energy than you should, your body stops uh, using energy that it doesn't need and it sort of brings in energy that uh, you already have. So you break down fat and you turn off uh, other functions. So it's sort of you preserve yourself, which is kind of nice. If you don't have it, obviously these systems don't work. Um, mTOR, everyone always wants to talk about rapamycin, right? So we're going to briefly touch on that. It senses the environment as well, but it acts, ooh, I'm sorry, opposite to the f previous two, okay? This is the builder of youth. It is an anabotic, anabolic process, excuse me, the other ones are more uh, catabolic. This is anabolic, it builds, which is very nice when you are young, when you need to build muscle, build brain tissue, you're, you're building, building, building. What happens when you get old, this becomes quite obsolete. When you force old cells to build, they become hyper-functioning and they cause bad things. Um, and your blood pressure goes up because smooth muscle cells become hyper-functional. Uh, osteoclasts become hyper-functional, causing an osteoporosis. And platelets become hyper-functional and you clot more and then you stroke. So it's not a good thing. Um, so obviously we want to block this pathway and the best blocker is rapamycin. People go, ooh, that's so good, we should all take rapamycin. And we really do give it to people. It's a great drug. It's a really potent drug. Um, you can tell by my picture, it was discovered on Easter Island in the 1970s after the statues. That's where the name, name comes from. We use it in cancer treatments because it blocks cellular growth. It can block regular growth. It can block cancerous growth. We use it to uh, suppress your immune system after kidney transplants. And they use it in drug-eluting stents because it blocks fibrosis to keep your stents open. It's a very potent drug. So when you look at it, you think, oh my goodness, it does some amazingly positive things. Delay in stem cell loss, cognitive decline, heart failure, fabulous things. But nothing good is always that good, right? <laughs> when you give it in real doses for real medical reasons, there's significant side effects. Um, obviously, it causes immunosuppression, because that's what it's built for. Um, and also, 60% of people swell up, they get edema. Many people get ulcers, 90% of people get alopecia, meaning they go bald, and people become infertile because they can't turn over the cells to make sperm and eggs. So even in lower doses, people go, oh, it's safe, it's not gonna hurt me, and the answer is, I'm not so sure. Studies are ongoing, don't jump on the bandwagon. Two issues that have been brought up in animal models is number one, your hippocampal cells do turn over. Everyone thinks your brain cells do not, and 97% of your brain cells don't, but 3% do. They're in your hippocampus, and they control neuronal plasticity. They have to change, or you don't remember anything. So there is a risk that if you take rapamycin, you won't remember that you're taking rapamycin. <laughs> Trying to entertain you guys, hopefully. It's All right, the second thing that happens is that you have to turn over your muscle, right? Muscle is not stagnant. You have to turn over your muscle. And if you don't, you become sarcopenic. You've seen the old people that have no muscle, that's sarcopenia. There are ways to avoid that, but rapamycin is so powerful that it's gonna be very hard to do. So you won't remember that you can't move, but otherwise you will live forever. <laughs> Clearly, it's not, I'm not a fan of rapamycin yet. We'll see as the, as the more stu studies come out. All right, 10 and 4, quality control. There are, as I said uh, earlier, there are serious problems in your DNA over time. I'll talk about that in one slide. There are four repair mechanisms for your DNA. There are four mechanisms to repair your proteins. And I always throw autophagy into this category because it seems like recycling should be there somewhere because it was sort of where else to put it. Anyway. Uh, so why do we need to repair our DNA? Everyone remembers the uh, structure of DNA, circulating, double helix, looks like a ladder, right? If you break one side of that, it's called a single stand break. In every cell, every day, you break up to 10,000 pieces. It's a lot, right? In terms of breaking the whole thing, it's five to 10 per cell per day. Yeah, a boatload of cells in your body. So your cellular repair mechanisms are extremely busy at all times. And as soon as they fail, any one of those errors can cause cancer. Okay, so this is an extremely important system. 
Uh, there are also errors in other things, substitutions, deletions. Anytime your DNA does anything, there's always room for error because you've got, you know, what, 10 billion base pairs. Something is always going to go wrong. Security systems. This is what the gentleman in front of me was talking about, so I'm going to talk about this really quickly. What goes wrong? Number one, your ability to fight infection goes down. Your, uh, 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 I can't speak. The chronic state of inflammation goes up, right? And the cells that make your immune cells are more likely to get cancer. So he talked about two of the things. I always throw in the cancer as well because I think it's quite serious. So. We tr uh, I'm not going to go too much into this because you just heard 40 minutes of it. But basically, chronic inflammation and aging is so bad, there's a word for it, inflammation. The factors uh, listed there are the ones that are most associated with it. Um, he talked about IL-6. It's, it's on there. A number of them are quite important. Do, 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 do. You get we all know increased, uh, whatever, we talked about that. Workforce. Different cells need different things. I like to pretend when I start giving this lecture or at the beginning of my book that all cells are the same. Clearly, they are not. A red cell, for example, lasts three months in your body. Doesn't really do too much. It doesn't make anything, but it's very nutrient uh, requiring in terms of the fact that it comes from a stem cell and you make billions of them a day. Versus a brain cell doesn't turn over, doesn't go anywhere, but the energy requirement is extremely high and it's very niche dependent. So depending on what cell you are talking about, short-lived, long-lived, stationary, uh, or circulatory, the needs are very different. Um, I like to tell people it's like if you have a factory, right, you've got some kids come in for college, they don't know a whole lot, but they've got a high energy, right, they don't stay very long. And then you've got the guys in the back, grumpy as heck, been there forever, but they have a lot of knowledge and you need them. So different types of cells, different types of requirements. And lastly, as I said earlier, you have to take out the garbage, right? Glucose causes AGEs. You guys all know what AGEs are, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and oxygen obviously causes free radical problems. And lastly, um, autophagy um, causes lipofusion. All right, so do you want the review on AGEs? Yes, please. Yes. yes, please. Okay, so glucose and oxidative stress in a multi non enzymatic reaction cause AGEs. If a glucose bonds to a protein, it's an AGE. If it bonds to a lipid, it is an ALE. If it bonds to a DNA, then it's not so clever. It's a DNA, AGE. Why is this important? Because number one, the glucose, when it sticks to the protein, the protein becomes completely unusable. Molecules work by shape, and if the shape is different, it doesn't work. Your body just spent a lot of time making that protein, and now it's completely non-functional, and you wasted a boatload of energy. AGEs, as well, are extremely inflammatory. So whatever inflammation you had before, now it is way worse. That's problem number two. Problem number three is that they're sticky. Glucose is sticky on the outside, like a lollipop, sticky on the inside. AGEs stick to collagen. Anything that is collagen-based, gets coated with this stuff, okay? I like to think of the analogy of a tablecloth. You think of fibers going in various directions, and they slide. You can take a new, fiber, new tablecloth, move it around, right? If you put a drop of super glue on there and it dries and you try to slide it, what happens to the fibers? They break. That's what happens to your skin. That's why people have congestive heart failure. That's why people get, one of the reasons people get droopy skin. That's why everything falls apart over time. So you need to be able to, number one, limit the amount of AGEs you have, and then get rid of them, and we're gonna talk about that. Lipofusion, cellular recycling. Every time you take an organelle and you don't need it anymore, you reprocess it, or if it breaks, you reprocess it. Cells are very good at this. 98-ish percent of an organelle can be reused. The pieces and parts that cannot be reused get pushed back into the cell, because the cell's like, I don't know what to do with this, right? It's just like, I call it the kitchen drawer phenomenon. You don't know what to do with it. There's a drawer in your kitchen. I've been everyone in this room. There's a drawer in your kitchen filled with crap, <laughs> right? You don't know what to do with it, and you're not gonna throw it out. The longer you are in your house, the less likely you are to be, op be able to open that drawer. <laughs> Same things happens with your cells. If it is a long-lived cell, that stuff gets more and more and more and more built up. If you look at the brain of a 90-year-old, it is filled with lipofusion. It is no wonder that people will say, well, I don't know why my grandfather can't think. Well, I'll tell you exactly why he can't think. He's loaded with gunk. It's the way that it is. 
Good news is I can tell you how to get rid of that today, so that's kind of fun. All right, the other interesting thing is we are not the only creatures that have lipofusion. This is the most accurate way of dating lobsters. All right, so if you really want to know how old the lobster is in the fish tank, take it down to your local AGE counter or whatever and uh, <laughs> slice open your brain and you can tell them how old it is, which is kind of fun. All right, so the review, DNA, mitochondria, aging pathways, repair mechanisms, immune, cell requirements, waste management, you guys got that? Yes. Sweet. <laughs> All right, so now I'm gonna introduce you to the protocol chart. I re realizing this looks complicated, it's not, and I'm gonna walk you through it. If you look across the top, you uh, next to the big 59, you see tenants one through seven. See that? Yeah. Yes, we just talked about those. Yes, this is in the book. Tenant one through seven. They will always be in exactly the same order, and that is crucial because that's the basis of my entire uh, plan here, okay? The molecular agents, and I call them molecular, molecular agents for a reason. People, everyone calls everything a supplement, okay? By definition, a supplement is something that you're adding to something that you already have, right? So if you don't already have it in your body, it's not a supplement, it's an adjuvant. Right? And some things are in fact vitamins, and some things are in fact minerals, but those are way different things. So rather than telling you everything individually, I call them all molecular agents because they all work on a molecular level. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Haha, right. ha. that's good. All right, so my molecular agents are listed down the side, and it doesn't really matter what they are at this point. This is someone's protocol that I put together at some point. And there's a bucket load of numbers there, right? Which you probably can't see because they're kind of small. And at the bottom is the summation of those numbers. And what this tells me is if you look at these numbers, how someone is doing in terms of planning their optimal anti-aging strategy. Because as far as I'm concerned, you can sit here and listen to every expert in the world, they have their pet project, right? Bill talks about the telomeres, and that guy was about the immune system, this person's about the cell, or about uh, like stem cells. You have to have a well-rounded plan. You can't take 70,000 things, I guess some of us do, but you don't have to. You just have to make sure you address all the reasons and address them in a reasonably organized fashion, right? So that's what uh, we're gonna try to talk about. And so what the way we're gonna do this is instead of uh, raindrops and roses, as my kids started to say, I'm gonna talk about a few of my favorite things. All right, the irony of course is I put uh, Sestante on there thinking this is gonna be so cool and novel and it turns out the you guys already heard about that today. <laughs> so that's one less thing you have to hear me talk about. All right, so astaxanthin. I love astaxanthin. You'll notice the ridiculous uh, seven numbers right there. It's the Kaufman rating number. Why? Because I did it. For better or for worse, I will take responsibility for that. There are seven numbers. The way this works, it is something does something in a category, it gets rated, right? If it does absolutely nothing, it gets a zero. If it is amazing, lots of... Uh, lots of uh, good scientific evidence, gets a three. Somewhere in the middle, it gets a one or a two, based on what I call the hierarchy of evidence, but we don't have to go into the details. Zero is uh, terrible, three is fantastic, and they're, and they're cumulative. So if you look at astaxanthin, you'll notice it has two real numbers, the three and the two, right? So let's back up for one sec. What is astaxanthin? Astaxanthin is so cool, because it is slimy algae, right? It is the goo that you see in bird baths, it is in every uh, small body of water. It's the slime that grows on rocks. Seems pretty gross and useless, right? The cool thing is if you piss it off, if you make it angry, and, and given they get angry about things that are different from what we get angry about, it creates astaxanthin and is an orange molecular slime. And you would think that these little globs and these little organelles, I mean, uh, and these little uh, tiny cells around the world wouldn't really do much. But in fact, it's responsible for everything pink and red in the marine system. Gets eaten by krill, which gets eaten by fish, which gets eaten by this and that and the other, you go up the food chain, right? So if you look, for example, at the grocery store, you go to buy salmon, for example, and it says artificially colored, buy it. Because they fed it astaxanthin. You just got free astaxanthin and fish, and it's cheaper, so I think that's really cool. <laughs> you guys care about fish, that's pretty, okay. All right, moving along. What does it do to your mitochondria? Tenet two, gets a three, must do something incredible. In fact, it really is rather incredible. It's one of the most powerful free radical scavengers in antioxidants that we have. Granted, those two things are not identical, but they're very close, and so I cluster them together because it's just far too much work to separate it out all the time. All right, 
tons of evidence, works in culture, works in small animal models, works in humans, stuff rocks, it gets a three. 10 at five, this stuff really boosts your immune system as well. All of the wonderful things that that guy talked about, this does it. Okay, it's just truly amazing. Most appropriately, reduces uh, nuclear factor kappa beta, which sits at the top of the immune chain. So if you reduce that, you reduce everything that comes below it. I like to talk about bonus properties. You have to look at these things under clinical conditions, which case you discover what it actually does to people. And depending on what system they look at, you may or may not discover these bonus properties. The Japanese love astaxanthin. I don't know why, different cultures like different things. They love astaxanthin. Every astaxanthin study, it's been done by the Japanese. They fed six milligrams to middle-aged people for one month, just one month. 60% of them reported that their vision got better. I will tell you that it works. My vision got way better. Of course, it's been like 17 years, but it, it works. Skin, if you eat this stuff, your skin gets better. You can exercise more. It is absolutely incredible stuff. That's astaxanthin. And I'm skipping through some of the details here because I don't want to put you guys to sleep. Carnosine. Anyone here take carnosine? Woohoo! Good, smart people. Good. So now we have learned that the seven digit rating number is my numbers, and we've learned that it does things in two categories, but it does them extraordinarily well, right? We also know, because it says it really small in the corner, this is a dipeptide, it's histamine and alanine. Carnis uh, bleh. Carnosine is present in all muscle. Everyone has it. Unfortunately, it goes down as you age, and men have more than women. It was discovered by the Russians in the 1900s. Um, and most of it comes from our diet, especially uh, chicken. Uh, chicken noodle soup is thought to be sort of curative because it has carnosine in it. Tuna, uh, mostly like things with wings. Uh, if you are a vegetarian, you are probably carnosine deficient. This is the coolest experiment in the world. I'm not gonna give you boring slides, I'm just gonna tell you what it says. If you take a bunch of old senescent grumpy cells, human fibroblast cells, and you put them in a bath of carnosine, they rejuvenate, yes. right? You're like, woohoo, you know this, right? <laughs> so we say scientifically that the senescent cells reverted to their juvenile phenotype. The cool thing is if you take them out of the bath, they go back to being old and grumpy. But you can put them back in the bath and they remain young. So the carnosine cells, they live longer, they live better, and by 25% increases the ability to divide. So I will tell you that everyone in this room should be on carnosine. That being said, if you take too much, your skin will tingle and you feel like you're on fire. So if, you, if you're gonna take a bunch, don't take it all at one time, spread it out. It takes about 10 days to build it up in your system and it stays in your system for about 10 days. So if you're gonna go on vacation for a week, you don't have to take it. Just know it's gonna slowly drift down when you get back, take it again. I have done all of these things because I'm a human experiment and I will tell you exactly what they feel like. So, category two, again, it's phenomenal on your mitochondria. Absolutely phenomenal. Best thing that we're doing though is in the waste management category, carnosine not only blocks AGE formation, it is a transglycosylating agent. That means trans, of course, is take the sugar off. It strips sugar off of you. It does. It's incredible. Very few things do this. This is huge. So what does it do? Cool parlor tricks. If you uh, listen to loud music and you're on carnosine, you will protect your nerves. If your kids uh, go to loud rock concerts, or if you go to loud rock concerts, my kids uh, is a loud concert. She plays the electric bass. I put her on this. Uh, vision. If you take carnosine eye drops, you can get rid of presbyopia. I have seen many people in this crowd pull out their reading glasses just to take pictures on their phone. Y this can go away, okay? They give it to 50,000 Russians, because you can do that to Russians, because there's no rules over there, and it got rid of their, ca <laughs> Would that be, we can't do that here, got rid of their cataracts, got rid of their presbyopia. And it makes your skin better. Metformin, who here's on metformin? Sweet! Okay, I recently had a lot of arguments with doctors who think that this is risky and you shouldn't do this. Uh, I'm here to tell you that they're crazy and everyone here that's on it is smart. You will see across the board, metformin does incredibly well in every category. The other thing that people say is, oh, can't I take barbarian? It does exactly the same thing. And the answer is, no, it doesn't. That's ridiculous. And I'm going to tell you why. So, but first we're going to back up. Why is metformin important? Why are we talking about metformin? 
right? Does anyone know? This is so cool. So in 2014, I'm going to tell you why. In 2014, uh, the, the Brits put out this study. They looked retrospectively at 15, no, I'm sorry, 150,000 people. It's a boatload of people. There were three groups. People, uh, diabetics on metformin, diabetics on sulfurias, and non-diabetics on nothing. They looked at it backwards. And they found out that if you were a diabetic on metformin, you lived 15% better, both morbidity and mortality. Theoretically, the non-diabetics on nothing should have done way better, but the diabetics on metformin did better. So that not only did they overcome not being or being a diabetic, they did better than that. So people looked at this and thought, oh my goodness, what is up with metformin? Um, but to back up a little bit, came from the French lilac plant, uh, people have been taking it since the medieval ages, probably before that for signs and symptoms, consistent with diabetes. Um, officially discovered in 1922. Uh, French put it out as a medication in um, 57, and we got it in 95. Another thing that people say is, oh gosh, I wouldn't want to be a guinea pig. I wouldn't want to be the first person on metformin. Well, I can tell you that in 2015, 150 million people were on metformin. So you are no way are you a guinea pig. All right, what does it do? It does a lot, so we're gonna skip through this quickly. Uh, tenet one, which is DNA, if you recall, is an epigenetic uh, modulator, does great things to your DNA. It uh, increases your genomic stability so you get less DNA damage, and it also stimulates your telomeres. Three wins. Tenet two, which is its weakest property, it's pretty good for your mitochondria, stimulates your endogenous uh, um, antioxidants. Pathways, it is an AMP kinase activator. So people say, I'm on a caloric restriction diet. You don't need to, you just need metformin because it does exactly the same thing. And you get to eat donuts. <laughs> um, the other cool thing, it is a partial inhibitor of the mTOR pathway. Does that ring any bells? That's what rapamycin does. But this is a partial inhibitor, rapamycin is a complete inhibitor. So you get what I think is most of the benefits with way less risk. I will tell you, however, you do get sarcopenia with it. Therefore, if you take leucine, you do not become sarcopenic, and you also need to take multivitamins because you do not uh, absorb your Bs as well. Those are the only two caveats. All right, tenant four, repair your DNA better. Five, your... Uh, do, 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 do. I, gosh, I lose track. These things do so many things. Your immune system benefits, and of course, uh, it's really cool. For whatever reason, metformin regenerates nerves. It's pretty cool. So if anyone is on your last nerve, you are so in luck. <laughs> My corny jokes, right? The real reason people are on metformin, of course, is glucose management, right? Reduces your blood glucose. People measure their hemoglobin A1C, which is a glycosylated red cells. Reduces AGE formation because you have less glucose. And then it also slows down lipofusion accumulation, so that's kind of cool. Um, side effects, most people that have tried this before, week or two, you get some uh, GI upset. Some people get some diarrhea, cramping, bloating, et cetera. If you can get past that, it goes away. Worst case scenario, three in 100,000 patient years can get lactic acidosis. That is pretty much if you have organ failure, kidney, liver, respiratory failure, extremely dehydrated, or you're uh, starving. Um, when I go on my mad, crazy, cross the planet adventures, I come off of this just temporarily. What does it do for us? Cool parlor tricks. Not as cool as the other ones, but probably more important. Cancer reduction. 30 to 50% of cancer reduction in diabetics on metformin. People always say, well, we don't know if that happens to people that don't have diabetes. And the answer is because we haven't had enough people without diabetes on it to be able to tell. But because of all of the other things it does, I would venture to guess that you would still see a significant cancer reduction. Uh, it delays menopause in mice. I'm really hoping that that works in humans. I don't know yet. Menopause, of course, is fraught with issues, atherosclerosis, uh, you know, increase in cancer risk, a variety of diseases, which we'd all care to avoid, so hopefully that will work. They give it to women with polycystic ovarian disease and they do much, much, much better. And lastly, and this is really interesting, your microbiota, has anyone talked about microbiota in here? Yeah. Population of, of bugs in your gut. To simplify things to a ridiculously sympathetic or pathetic uh, situation, there are fat bacteria and there are skinny people bacteria. So metformin chooses out the skinny people bacteria. So just by definition, you can be skinnier just taking metformin. If that was the only thing it did, you would still benefit. 
Okay, any questions on metformin? Otherwise we're moving along. Curcumin. I'm sure everyone in this room is on curcumin, right? Yes. Sweet, this guy's got everything. I love him. <laughs> My kids call this liquid gold because I get it everywhere. All of my clothes have turned yellow. My skin turns yellow. Love this stuff. Um, it does a boatload of things in a boatload of categories. So uh, basically it's been around forever, number one. It's been in uh, Vedic uh, India for 4,000 years. Uh, they've used it for everything, right? It's a spice. It's a decoration. It's everything. The monks dye their, uh, their outfits with it. Came to China, 700 AD, Africa by 800 AD. A uh, very famous Persian physician, Avicenna, wrote about it in the Middle Ages. And finally, it was smuggled by Marco Polo here because he smuggled anything of value, right? <laughs> oh, that, that number got moved, quite sorry. What is curcumin? It's a polyphenol. Comes from uh, turmeric or turmeric, potato, potato, right? People say that differently. Um, comes from the roots, from the ginger family. Um, unfortunately, and you guys probably already know this, only three to five percent of turmeric is actually curcumin. So people say, oh, I'm on turmeric, and I go, yeah, so close. Um, not quite, you need to be actually on um, curcumin and a certain variety or two, and I will get to that momentarily. So 10 at one, uh, DNA alterations, it is a very, very potent epigenetic modifier, so that's kind of nice. Uh, category two, it's extremely strong free radical scavenger. Extremely strong. Activate your AMP kinase, so that's kind of nice. But the real reason that we're talking about this is five and seven. It's fabulous for your immune system. Absolutely fabulous for your immune system. And as far as I know, it is the only thing that decreases the expression of the receptor for AGEs. That's kind of a mouthful, did you guys get that? On every cell, there is a receptor. The AGE sticks to it and it creates a huge inflammatory response. If you get rid of the receptor, you get rid of half of the issues of the AGEs. Curcumin blocks the production of that receptor. So that's huge in the anti-inflammatory world. Yeah. All right, that's huge. The last thing it does, and I love this dearly, is the only agent that gets rid of light perfusion in your brain. Cleans out your kitchen drawer. Liquid gold, I tell you. You too will be coated in yellow. So what does it do clinically? Huge anti-inflammatory. Uh-oh, I'm getting the light. All right, I'm, I'll try to be good. Uh, topically and uh, systemically. And, uh, see, now I've got like, oh gosh, so much to talk about. I'll try to speed through things. Uh, good for cancer, metabolic syndrome. Uh, it's antimicrobial. Bad thing about uh, curcumin, uh, poor bioavailability. Every Superman has his kryptonite, this is its problem. Uh, when you absorb it, it disappears immediately. So everyone and his brothers tried to come up with formulations to make it more efficacious. My favorite one is the combination of pepper. Pepper inhibits the metabolism because it blocks the liver enzymes. So they roughly have the same timing. Um, it's really quite brilliant, honestly. Years have passed, we don't have to do that anymore. Top two now, and I don't work for anyone, so it doesn't mean anything, I can tell you any brand I want. My favorite are BCM95 and Metacurcumin. Extremely potent, very efficacious, and have the best bioavailability. All right, you guys, you can hear about chibulic acid, a clonia cava, or, all right, chibulic acid or um, a clonia cava? Chibulic acid. acid. My favorite, ah, oh, I love you. Chibulic acid, anyone here heard of chibulic acid? Ah, today's your lucky day. Okay, what is chibulic, and this will be my last one so you can stop shining the light at me. All right. It's very old. It comes from Chinese, Tibetan, and Ayurvedic literature, so we know it's very efficacious. Obviously, that makes it from that part of the world. It comes from the dried fruit of a plant, Terminala, I always forget this, Chibula, obviously. It's called many things in many cultures. Uh, the Tibetans call it the king of medicine, which kind of says a lot, right? Uh, the Ayurvedic tradition call it Harataki, and that's sort of stuck in our community, so if you hear Harataki, that's Chibulic acid. Uh, interestingly, Harataki means carries away. And what's cool is the implication is it carries away all diseases, which that means a lot to me. And also, oh, either that or has a really good PR agent. <laughs> Chibulic acid is also combined with two other drugs in something called trifala. People have been doing this for thousands of years. Different cultures have done it. Uh, in the Tibetan uh, world, it's called three fruit or bras boo. In contemporary world, it's called padmahepatin. 
A Swiss company makes it. And I can tell you that 64% of Padma Hepatin is tribulic acid, working out to about 200 milligrams. Why are we talking about this? Well, the first bunch of categories, not so too exciting, mitochondria are good, security is good, cell health is good. This is the important thing. Waste management. Number one, it is a hypoglycemic agent, so it lowers your blood glucose. But number two, um, actually it does two things. It blocks the production of AGEs. And it's one of the only things thus far that can actually separate AGE collagen crosslinks. It's even better than carnosine because that's just a transglycosylating. This can actually reverse it. Um, number one, you can do it in a test tube. My kids were laughing because the picture at the top demonstrates how the glucose molecule sticks two collagens together. And I couldn't figure out how to flip the arrow. And there's no picture on the internet that demonstrates that because nothing does it. Just tubulic acid. So they gave it to mice, right? I know mice aren't people, but I know a few people that are kind of mice-like, so I figure it kind of counts, right? <laughs> it reduces the glucose, number one, and it reduces the AGEs that have accumulated in the seminiferous tubules, which is why they think diabetics are less uh, able to produce children. Does it work in humans? I don't know. I'm really hoping it does. Um, I don't really know. They think that it does too. And they've hypothesized that for a 60 kilo person, you'd need about 1,440 milligrams a day. Is that feasible? It's a good question, right? If you take a capsule of Herataki, it's 500 milligrams, but we really don't know how much tubulic acid is in that. Or you can take the Padma Hepatin, we know there's 200 milligrams per tab, which makes it seven to eight tablets a day. It's like kind of a lot to swallow. So I have devised what I call Herataki holidays. Every two weeks, I take a buttload. You can ask me what a buttload is and how I came to that number. The answer is it's like five or six. Because any more than that, I get a rip-roaring headache. Any less than that, does, I don't know if it's doing anything. I still don't really know if it's doing anything, but I think it does because my skin looks better than it used to. All right? So I've invented the Herataki holiday. Someday I will have uh, evidence that it actually works. Until that, we're just going on uh, science. What else does it do? This is kind of cool. It's antibacterial, antiviral. Uh, prevents CMV. In my world, that's huge because uh, there are a lot of, um, if, if a mom gets pregnant when they have CMV, just horrific birth defects. So in my world, that's important. Uh, helps with the flu, gastric ulcers, blocks histamine release, good for anyone with allergies. And this is my favorite. It promotes the perceiving powers of the five senses. I don't really know what that means, but it sounds like you get spidey senses, right? <laughs> I think that's kind of cool. I don't know what it does, but I think it's kind of cool. And that's it. We didn't talk about that one because you've had enough. Ba, 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 Clonia cava, that's an algae. Actually, it's not. It's a seaweed, does amazing things. So to get to the end of this, I have a master chart. There are 30 things rated now. I am actively adding more. It takes a lot of time to do this. I want it to be as accurate as possible. I do a ton of reading and I slowly add to the list and that list slowly is gonna increase on my website and on the app. People say, oh my gosh, do I have to take all that? Of course not, of course not. But what you need to do is you need to create your protocol chart. So you pick and choose based on what you want. Do you have more glucose issues? Load up the waste, the waste column. You've got inflammatory issues, you work on the security column. But you can't ignore any of the columns. If you don't know how to take them, I don't have an office, I wish I did. You come to my office, pay me a million dollars and I'll tell you what to take. I can't do that, I don't have time. So I created an app. You go in there, you put your medical issues in there, you put what you, how many pills you're willing to take, and it'll just tell you what to take based on an algorithm that I wrote. The other thing that I will do is I have a website, I answer a zillion emails a day, people go, I put together the following protocol, is this good for me? And I'll look at it, and I'll tell you, add this, take away that. Because I want people to be able to have real knowledge for themselves that's practical and affordable. Blah, blah, blah. So that's the app. That's the book. It's a boatload of citations. Anyone have any questions? Dr. Kaufman, you are awesome. Wow. I've read your book, and it is very, very detailed and really good. So Thank you. Get the, the book. Get the it book. Is. Get the book. Um, so I actually do have a question for you. So you talked about lipofusion, lipofusion mm -hmm. and <clears throat> when you actually had told me about carnosine a while back, your last presentation, which was a great bonus, so thank you so much, I started adding in DMAE, mm -hmm. which DMAE has been in some way or form shown to also help with mental clarity, 
by slowly getting rid of lipofusion. But then I was just brought to my attention about centrophenoxin. Have you heard much about centrophenoxin, which is supposed to be way more potent because it's DMAE and something else that I'm forgetting? Thank you, and it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So, so. Does curcumin's better crossing the blood-brain barrier. So, okay, so cool. So the answer is, is I hate answering questions when I'm still working through. Sure. I have my sentiments about it, sure. and I will tell you shortly, because I don't read one or two articles, yeah. I read like 50 articles. Yeah. And I will find out exactly what I think for you very cool. shortly. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate that. Who's next? Um, I w I've read your book and I'm trying to, Ooh, well, I have you. been putting together the pieces as far as what to take and so on. I have a question about the NAD part. Mm -hmm. um, what do you recommend to get? Because I've been looking at, at different things that are available other than the IVs and all that is fine. I can't, I'm not really clear as to what it is that, what I, what I can get, which product exactly. So at the because moment. Because they're mostly no, the precursors, right? Right, right. So, you, so taking NAD itself you, you can't do it. You, d you definitely have to take a precursor. There are eight steps from tryptophan to get to NAD. At the moment, the two that are readily available is NR and NMN. I have not seen any comparative literature to determine which is better. I started with one. I've sort of backtracked to the other to see if I could compare and contrast in my own body. I can't really tell. I'm waiting for head-to-head -head studies. I think that they both do it. I don't know if their timing is exactly the same, but I think over time it doesn't really matter which one you take as long as you do it consistently. Um, I think that the infusions are probably ridiculous. I, I've worked in a hospital for 20 years. I can tell you that no one's ever come in dying of an IV requirement for NAD. Um, you do suffer over time, but you can replenish in roughly, uh, you know, probably two to three weeks. What I tell people over the age of 40, 45, take a reasonably high dose every day for three months. You watch your energy levels go up. It's just, I take one pill a day. Oh, I'm sorry, I, it, do, it doesn't matter. It's either, NA, either NR or NMN. Uh, it's the mononucleotide. Um, as your energy, because you're your best gauge. As your energy levels go up, you sit there, you hold on after six months, I tell, because it's expensive for most people. And I don't think once that you, once you are replenished, you don't need as much as they're giving you. So I tell people, take it every other day and see if your energy levels drop. If they drop, then you need more. And if they don't, you're fine to take it every other day. Because it really is rather cost prohibitive. How long is those, those carnosine eye drops, how long are you supposed to, how long does it take to get some kind of result on that? About a month and a half. Oh, that's bad news. Depends how, it's <laughs> depends no, how severe news. your vision is. Hi. Yes, ma'am. So excited you're here. The last time you were here, you uh, someone asked about collagen, and you said, "I eat it," and I that's do. the last we talked about it. So I, um, I'm doing that, Good. but I want to know how you're doing that, and how soon to see results, and what to actually start to look for. Um, like I have a, a, a one that's at seven collagens in it. I I don't know shit right. about shit about it. So, that's so, why I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah. So so I'm working on a book right now on skin. Your body, your cells age for seven reasons. Your scales, uh, skin cells age for nine reasons because there's more extraneous stuff hitting us. So in order to tackle the skin problem, which is why you're asking about collagen, the good news is there's collagen all over your body. The half life of collagen is 17 years. So the good news is that you can take time to build it back because it's not leaving you as fast as you think that it is. Um, hyaluronic acid, uh, half-life is 24 hours. Um, so you need to replenish hyaluronic before you think about collagen, but honestly, both is good. The other thing that I like are MMP inhibitors, and one of the things that we didn't get to, to talk about, your skin dissolves. Inflammation causes something called MMPs. There's uh, 27 of them, and they dissolve your collagen. They dissolve most of your skin products. It's built for um, when something comes in, you need to get rid of the old crap and then like rebuild tissue. That's what MMPs are for. But over time, um, all, everything that's good is bad and everything that's bad is good, right? So these things sort of take over and they dissolve your collagen. So number one, take collagen. It doesn't really matter which one or how much, just take it. You need to take an MMP inhibitor, which we didn't talk about, which is a clonia cava. And then you need to take hyaluronic acid. There's a, internally? internally. Hyaluronic internally, I take 200 milligrams a day. Amazon. So, so a clonia cava, which we didn't get a chance to talk about, is an algae um, 
comes from Korea and Japan, and one of the really cool things is that it is an MMP inhibitor. So it blocks the breakdown of your skin. The other one is white tea. So I put topically white tea all over me, and then I eat the Aclonia cava, and it helps your skin. Here you go. Yes, ma'am. Hi. You were going to speak to why you think berberine is not a great um, Right. So berberine is really good in terms of the glucose issues. Yeah. But it doesn't do any of the other things that metformin does. Oh, okay. So it doesn't help your DNA. It's not an epigenetic modifier. It doesn't help neuronal growth. It doesn't do any of those things. If you're simply trying to replace the hypoglycemic aspects, then sure, it's great. But it's just not as all-encompassing. So can I um, piggyback on that with metformin? If you have hypoglycemic, if your index is out of balance... Will you have a response to the metformin like, like I did? <laughs> I mean. So you shouldn't become ever hypoglycemic on metformin. Excuse me. There is a feedback loop whereby um, lactic acid in your gut gets reabsorbed and processed into glucose. So it's been clinically demonstrated you cannot become hypoglycemic. Really? Really. Okay. As I took it and I... I mean, that being said, people have various reactions to various things. And, and maybe you're just a little, you know, may I, yeah, I don't know. But I can tell you that science demonstrates that you should not do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, what dose, that's a very good point. What dose are you taking? question on a um, couple things. Bring carnosine on. dosing, carnosine absorption, and um, use of beta alanine. All right, how to formulate this. All right, so we'll start at uh, dosing. Most people start at 500 a day. You can work up. Men, the bigger you are, obviously, the more you can tolerate. Um, I take between 1,000 and 1,500 a day, but I have to space it out because I get the, the paresthesias. Um, different people, men, need less because you already have more. If you are athletic, you need, if you, if you have bigger muscle, you need more because it, it goes into your muscle, it absorbs the acidosis, um, therefore, when you're exercising, you don't burn, blah, 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 so it's great for athletes. But as a man with big muscle, you theoretically should need more but you already have more, therefore you have to titrate it. So this is gonna sound really dumb and this is like a bad way of doing it. You keep taking it until you get skin paresthesias and then back off. The caveat, right, that sounds like a really dumb thing for a doctor to say, but that's the only way of knowing exactly how much you're going to need. What is skin paresthesias? Skin paresthesias are where your skin feels like it's on fire. First time I did it, I was kind of a little scary. After that, you go, ah, okay. Lasts about 10, 15 minutes, you just feel like, woo, and then voom, it goes away. Huh? No, it's different. It's different. I can't, exp uh, try it. I can guarantee you it can't hurt you and it's very short-lived. Um, second half of the question. If you just take the alanine, obviously it's a dipeptide, if you just take the alanine, it will in fact go into your muscle and it helps with the muscle issues, but it does not help as a transglycosylating agent. Um, the other caveat to that is there is an enzyme that breaks carnosine down, it's carnosine ACE. People that are born without it that have too much carnosine as infants have significant metabolic disturbances and they're just not normal. As a consequence, the more you take carnosine, your body obviously is feedback loops. You will make more carnosine ACE. Therefore, it'll seem like over the course of time, you need more and more and more for the same thing. So if you take it for years, it is smart to take carnosine breaks so that your enzymes come back down so that you can take more again. Anybody else? There's a couple right there. I have a question about the curcumin. Mm -hmm. So it's anti-inflammatory, but it's also a blood thinner, for, from what I heard. And when I take it, I, you know, so I guess my blood is kind of thin anyway. So when I take it, I have like nosebleeds or t type of thing. But I, you know, so I don't know, like what's. I don't take a high dosage or anything like that. But so I everyone don't know. has intolerance to something. 
I think you, you know, as, as a physician, you see this. You know, you'll say one in a billion people have X, and you think, oh, that's ridiculous. What? There, there is always someone that something bad happens to. If you're the person, for example, you can't take metformin, if you can't take curcumin, that's just the way that it is. Um, but that's okay because there are a zillion other options and ways of reaching the same end, which is why I don't tell everyone you have to be on this. You have to be on something that does the same thing. What you may wanna do is there's a great curcumin gel. Uh, I put it all over me. I love it so much I became a distributor because it was cheaper that way. Um, and and it, it enough may absorb through your skin to number one, help your skin and then help things in, in other ways. Just, just, just a thought. What's your recommendation for metformin uh, dosage uh, in case you don't eat a lot of sugar? So the lowest dose people usually start out with is 500. When you start, you start at 500. If you tolerate that for about three weeks, you double it, you go to twice a day. If you're a big person, you can take it three times a day. Um, I've heard that a lot of people take two to three grams. I think that's kind of crazy. Um, I take 850 twice a day, but I've been on it for years. So as a starter dose, start with 500 once a day, and it's going to cause you GI upset. It's just in everybody for the first week or two. If you cannot tolerate it all, take half, which is 250. If you still can't tolerate it, you know, bail and go a different direction. There are other ways of getting to the same place, but, but try 500 once a day to start with. Very good. I do have one last question in regards to the white tea that you said you put all over your body. Do you have a specific brand that you're using? Do you brew your own? How do you do that? Because I love that. I am the world's biggest guinea pig, um, which is why I have bruises on my face that you may or may not be able to see because I was reinventing PRP and self-injecting last week. I tried to cover it up. I'm not a victim of domestic violence. Self-imposed, I guess, domestic violence. Um, so what's interesting is you can buy concentrated white tea from companies that make cosmetics. So what I do, it sounds ridiculous, I love aloe vera, topical aloe vera. So I get it in jugs and I put in a huge thing of white tea, I put in a huge thing of quercetin, um, and depending on what else I have floating around, I mix it all together. Uh, it looks like swamp juice, it's pretty gross. Clearly it will never be a, a giant uh, commercial venture. <laughs> but I swim in the stuff and I love it. But you can buy it in like, you know, yay big containers. But you can't, you have to go to the people that make cosmetics. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman. You're welcome. <laughs>